Hello, welcome to our show tonight, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Brad Green. I'm an Eng director here at Google that I manage the Angular team. We've got actually a ton of folks here tonight from the team and kind of our extended community. And I'm going to start out with a couple announcements, just like we do always, and then we'll kick it off to Hans for some, some good stuff. All right, yeah. So uh, actually, self-promo, I did a bunch of talks about Angular earlier this month. And you can go check them out. And I'll, I'll share these slides with you. So I did a talk at Fluent about kind of the future of HTML apps. I reused almost exactly the same content at Microsoft. So if you've seen one, you've kind of seen them both. Uh, but maybe you could watch that one because it's got updated stuff. Although I think I did a better job at Fluent. And then we, we did this nice interview with Anders, who's the inventor of TypeScript, and talked about how we've been collaborating as a team and, and things that we've done together. Uh, I thought that was pretty good. Other stuff. We are quickly closing in on an Angular 2 stable release. And we're really excited to get there. You can track it on GitHub. We're kind of at 44% complete. We're you know, really trying to bring this in as quickly as possible. But go to GitHub Angular Angular Milestones, and you can follow along at home. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. So um, as by the way, it's not 44% of the total thing that we've been working on it for uh, since 2014. This is since we started tracking the end state milestone. WebStorm has recently, in their latest update, has some amazing support for Angular 2, and specifically in the templates about giving you feedback on am I typing the right thing, auto-completing, um, you know, automatic code generation, doing automated imports. Go check out their blog on this. It's a pretty good experience. We are not going to be here in May, and it's because we're going to be at two other shows. We're going to be at ng-conf in uh, Salt Lake City, which is our kind of big UI show for the year. And then at Google I.O., you can catch a couple of us there. And all of this is going to be live streamed. So you can go check us out uh, while we do the presentation. So lots of great Angular content happening at both of those shows. That's it. You can get the, these slides uh, at this link. And I will share this on Twitter if you follow me, Bradley Green. I'll find it there. Hey, Eric. And uh, enjoy the show. Hans, come on up. All right. So today I'm going to talk about the uh, Angular CLI, which we're going to call NG for short. Um, CLI for, stands for command line interface, in case some people don't know about it. Um, and before going on, just, just as a show of hand, like, thank you. Um, <laughs> so, how many people, how many uh, amongst you have ever used a CLI before, a command line tool? OK, cool. Uh, that's actually a lot better uh, than I thought. Um, so well, most of you will be familiar with the concept. I mean, it's nothing revolutionary, except that it's revolutionary in the sense that it's for Angular 2. And for you that never used the tool, please uh, stay tuned. This is going to be amazing. So, so a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Hans Larsen. You may remember me from such presentations as, such as ES3, the last language you'll ever need. Um, I've been a Google engineer for six years. Um, two, two of them were not at Google. And I've been a front-end in front-end development and component builder for four of those. Um, I'm currently the lead on the CLI project inside the, uh, the Angular team at Google. And I love Tacosis or Takai. I'm not sure exactly. Um, so a little bit about uh, the CLI itself. So the CLI, it's, a, it's just a command line tool that allows you to uh, create, manage, and deploy apps uh, made with Angular 2. It's the official Angular tool. We manage the project. But I just want to do a shout out to all the contributors out there who uh, helps us every day of the week and month. And um, it helps you create a new project from scratch, which is always a difficult task, like what's going to be my directory structure, what's going to be like all the, all the conventions and all the style guides that we support in Angular 2. Um, and so the tool really helps you make the right decision along the way. And what we really want to do here is make it easy for you and make it super helpful to basically go from your idea 
to a deployed application as fast as possible. You should concentrate on the code, on what you want to do, and not necessarily like on everything else. So just a bit of warning. Um, this is pre-alpha. Um, I, I say that we don't have no users, only fools, but we do have users all around. We do support them the best we can. Uh, we're planning a release, a stable release soon, so stay tuned for that. But right now, if you use it, if you try to build real big applications with it, you're a little bit on your own. Um, how do you get it? The same way you get any um, install to, uh, CLI tools on Node, you basically npm install it, and then you just ng new your project, and basically it's created, and then you can start serving it locally. Um, the CLI allows you to create basically route uh, services, uh, pipes, components, directives, everything that you ever need at, uh, inside Angular, and it configures them the best way it can. Of course, sometimes you need to adjust it, but it does generate the code for you, the basic code for you. And um, it also helps generate tests, which you can run with ng test. Of course, uh, it generates some end-to-end -end test that you can just start using and start modifying. It allows you to lint your code and format it using Clang format. So if you guys are using that, you can definitely use um, our defaults and our settings for that. Um, there is a general configuration for your projects. If you defer, I'm just going to go through that. There is currently a deploy for GitHub pages, and uh, we support like documentation lookup for Angular. So I'm going to do a short demo of the CLI itself because Really, that's what you guys came to see, right? So here's a console. All right. So what we're going to do for an app, I'm going to try to put this a little bit closer so we can get personal. Uh, we're going to do a little chat app. Um, we're going to use multiple components to show you, oops, to show you um, how to integrate with stuff like the Angular Material 2, uh, the Angular 2 Material components, and we're going to use Angular Firebase as well. Um, so you guys will have a good appreciation of what uh, how to do, how to do integration with libraries. So we start by creating a new project. Uh, this can take a while, but um, in order to make it faster, what we're going to do is I created a project before. I cached the, um, the node, um, and we're going to reuse all of that. All right, so uh, we created our app. Um, just to show you, if we ng serve right now, it's going to be built, and it's going to be um, uh, local. There you go. It's going to just say that it works, which is a good sign normally. Woo. So you might not just want to do that. So maybe you want to do, actually, uh, let me do. Uh, wait. Well, that's going to be faster. So we're going to install a bunch of, um, so we're going to install Firebase, uh, Angular Fire 2, because we want to use the component for Angular Fire 2, a bunch of Angular 2 material components that are really awesome. I urge everyone to start installing them and using them everywhere. No, uh, the brackets. That's just for enumerating stuff. And uh, SAS. So the Angular CLI supports SAS less uh, stylus and compass by default. If you just install the known modules that are required to compile SAS, it's going to start compiling your SAS files. Uh, this should take a little bit less time because I just basically untar the. Uh... There you go. So that was installing like seven packages over Wi-Fi. And because we're done, so we say we commit. 
this is a pure Git repo. There is no remote right now. If you want to add one, you need to add one. But there is an in, there is an history, a default history. And so uh, I'm just gonna go and yeah, yeah. There you go. Isn't that beautiful? So, um, oh. by default, uh, the CLI creates a default project, a default skeleton. It looks, um, it looks like this. There is a public directory that contains uh, basically any assets that you want to transfer, uh, the source uh, for the client, and uh, the basic apps inside of it with a template, a basic component, and some unit tests to get you started and some end-to-end -end tests as well. Uh, the directory structure might change a little bit, but this is mostly, um, this is gonna be mostly valid. And so what we wanna do first is, um, wait. Um, what we wanna do first is basically go to the Angular CLI build and add some vendors. So we just installed a, a bunch of packages, like the Angular material ones, so what we want to do is add some vendor, uh, some some files to the build. So basically, this tells the CLI when you build this Angular 2 app, you need to copy these files to the this uh, to this this distribution folder. And uh, because these files, because these files um, are inside a different uh, vendor. Uh, directory on the um, in the disk repo. We need to go into the index.html, um, and there you go, and configure system.js. So we use system.js for uh, loading all the dependencies, and we need to configure when we add a new third-party library. We need to configure system.js. Um, we're actively looking to make this step way easier than it is because it's one of the most asked question on Gitter, how to configure this file. So that was for um, that was for material. Let's do the same for uh, Firebase. So we basically just use Angular Fire 2 and Firebase. We paste we pass everything that's a JavaScript file in um, the build system. Oops, that's not the right one. Yeah, that's the right one. And again, we need to configure. Um, we need to configure the uh, system JS. So now we're ready to start importing stuff, and we need the providers for uh, Firebase because Firebase requires uh, Angular Fire 2 as uh, providers for that. So we go to the main app and we import them just as you would. Oh. Huh. Okay. Um, sorry, apparently my copy pasta was not strong enough. All right. So system.js makes the link between this and the JavaScript files that we just passed to the build system. The build system takes them, take the vendor NPM files and copy them over to uh, the distribution folder. So now we're going to go here and do ng cert. And we're going to see that it works. Uh, So it keeps working, uh, but it doesn't do anything because, well, we didn't do anything. We just added the default like providers and the default uh, dependencies. But now we can start um, we can start actually generating routes. So I'm going to go to the same project. Okay, no, actually I'm going to stay here because I really love having the serve at the same time. Gonna zoom in. All right. Um, 
So what I'm going to do is generate a new route, and I'm going to call that route welcome, because we need a welcome screen. Everybody wants to be welcome to a website. So it creates a TS. Uh, this is not the right blueprint, so the new version will create also a spec and uh, some tests, adding some tests to it. So there are many, there is a little bit of, um, if I go here and I open up, okay. So, uh, so this is the default route generated. As you can see, it's a middle route. So we want to make it basically a leaf. So we remove every route outlets and everything from it so that it's just a component that can be routed to. And we might say, welcome. And now in the uh, chatty, the TS, the main file or main component, as you can see, we generated the route for you inside of um, the route config of the parent. So what we want to do is remove the dot, 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 because it's a leaf route now. And we want to use it as default. Uh, so now, as you can see, we navigate it to welcome, which is our default route. And we got the welcome showing. So just by generating, modifying a couple of lines, uh, the process is really straight, straightforward. It's relatively simple. Once you do it once, you know how to do it every time. Uh, but this is kind of blend. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to add a, we're going to go back to our welcome screen. Uh, welcome TS, sorry. Did I say screen? Um, and we're going to add a little bit of flavor. We're going to add a card. We're going to add a little toolbar to it so that it says welcome to ng chatty. And we have a button that will use the Angular Fire um, and that will perform authentication for us. So the Angular Fire gets injected by the providers we added earlier. And we just use it inside of this. So now, if I go back, as you can see, we can see I didn't need to reload. I didn't, I didn't need to uh, refresh the page. The page is auto-refreshed. Uh, the server keeps compiling every time it sees a change. Um, I can even go back and see that like it took me 200 milliseconds to compile these files, the, these new files. And if I do login, well, oh, I'm still logged into uh, GitHub, but basically it will log me into GitHub if I use a new incognito window. There you go. So now I can enter my, uh, court, my um, credentials and it will work. Um, all right, so we, just for a little demo of things to do, we're gonna generate a service that we're gonna call <coughs> chat service that will do the connection to uh, the database. And we want to add the, the, the service to the import, Okay, so so we just add it to the imports and we add it to the provider list. And that service um, is probably very empty right now. It's, it's empty, it's a minimum service that we can generate. It gives you already a good shell. Um, we're just going to import Angular Fire, use it internally, and then have a not object, a get message list to get the messages that we want for that channel, and a send message for sending messages to the channel, and using the username that you provide, and putting a timestamp on it. And the next step is going to be to create a channel. So the same as a welcome street, a street, a screen, sorry, I want to generate a route and call it channel. 
And in this case, I want it to be a leaf route as well. So I go to the chatty.ts. And as I can see, it created, a, it created the path for me. What I want is to put the channel name in it. And what I want for the channel, I'm going to put stuff in it. I'm going to describe it really quick to you. Uh, if I go to channel.ts, as you can see, it's basically the same thing that was generated for the welcome screen. Uh, and I'm going to add a template that shows a toolbar with the channel name, um, show you all the messages, and have an MD input for the new messages. And that uh, will use uh, the params of the, of, the, um, of the route. And basically, when you click, when you press enter on, a, on the input, it will add message. It will send a message using the service that we used that we declared, that we just declared. And if it's not authenticated, it's going to return to the welcome screen. So just to prove, to show you that um, we, um, we support SAS out of the box, if I go to the channel, so in the channel itself, um, I use uh, the channel.css and If I create a new channel that scss in there, I add it to git. I don't want to watch it. Yes, I know. And I copy my um, scss. So it's really a CSS with a host with inline. Uh, as you can see, that's definitely not valid CSS. And if I go back to the tool and I press login, and I go to uh, channel slash general. Something happens. Uh, get channel message list is not a function. So let's see what let's see what happened. I think I think it might not be a function. <laughs> But it is. Um, okay, I'm gonna do something that normally everybody should do: is um, ignore the disk folder, empty folder. Now, if I go to chat service. Um, A little bit of debugging. So chat service is there. The new channel. Wait, did I add it to the? No, I added it to the providers. Hmm, good one. Well, I'm uh, going to cut it short. <laughs> yes. um, but as you can see, basically, I'm going to go back to the slides. But as you can see, like, I, didn't, I didn't restart uh, the CLI. Every time I created new stuff, the CLI just picked it up, compiled it, outputted it, showed it, to, um, and served it on the local host. And all the skeletons kind of make sense. All right. Um, so some some uh, little bit of warning about the issues that we're focusing on right now is uh, the style guide is not 100% ready. Uh, John Papa and Ward Bell and Igor are working on this um, really hard, 24 hours seven. Uh, right now, the CLI only supports TypeScript, um, and that's going to be something that will still be there uh, during the stable release. And 
Uh, it's production environment not ready right now. What is missing is that we compile your file, we're minifying it when you build for production. Uh, we're not bundling it yet, and we're not using uh, CDN. But these are features that we're going to uh, release before we make it uh, stable. And finally, um, something that we, what, what will happen in the future, like past 1.0 release, is that we want a better third-party install story. We want to support your uh, third parties. We want to make it easier for you to not have to change the vendor file and the system JS configuration as much as possible. Uh, we want IDE integration that you can use uh, with the CLI. So a lot of the things in there that the, C the IDE could could use a CLI to provide you better information. Uh, we want to use a, to create an add-on system that will allow you to package, that will allow packages that you make uh, to better, to integrate closer with everything, every steps that the CLI exists so that uh, you can add custom stuff like including the custom backends and people can just install it and enjoy it. Um, and we want to have more deploy options uh, including custom servers, so Firebase, Docker, Heroku. People are already working on some of those, so that's going to be great. And the support for progressive web apps, uh, that's uh, Jeff's team's probably going to help with. Yes? Cool. And more tacos, of course. Mm -hmm. More tacos. Uh, you can get it. You can come to GitHub. Uh, we do take issues. Uh, no, we don't. We do accept your issues. <laughs> Wording. Um, we're really welcome. We have a Gitter channel as well that I forgot to put in there. But if you guys want to start using it and start like giving us feedback, uh, filing issues, there's stuff that might be just closed as working as intended. We know about the issue, um, some stuff like that. But normally, we're friendly enough. Don't be afraid. That's it. Uh, so now we're going to welcome our very own Rob Wormald to the podium to talk about HTTP, the the new. Okay. All right. Cool. HTTP, the Angular two, reimagined HTTP. Uh, I'm Rob Wormald, as Jeff said. I'm uh, the developer advocate on Angular. I also work on the mobile team uh, with Jeff and Alex and some other people. We're building the progressive web apps and stuff that uh, Hans mentioned. Uh, I'm at Rob Wormald on Twitter, and I'm uh, github.com slash Rob Wormald. Yeah, and it's it's Rob Wormald, not Wormwald, as everybody seems to. I get that wrong. Everybody gets it wrong. <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry about it. Wormald, Wormald, whatever. So uh, who here is an Angular 1 user? Yeah, you'd expect that, right? Uh, so we, uh, obviously, in Angular 2, we are providing you with uh, an HTTP library. Uh, it's a little bit, a lot of bit different, though. So I'm going to talk today about some of the differences uh, kind of some of the major things, some of the benefits. We'll do a couple of demos, hopefully, that won't blow up in my face, hopefully. Uh, so we'll see. So uh, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard doing this, right? Like Rub it's... it in. Yeah. <laughs> Rub it in. So uh, if you're an Angular 1 developer, you know uh, about Promises. And I think that Angular 1 was probably one of the, the biggest libraries to bring Promises kind of into the mainstream. So HTTP is a, a pretty common use case for that. Uh, Big news that everybody's kind of seen before. So this is your kind of your regular Angular 1 usage, uh, http.get, get some data. Uh, you get a response object. It's got some data attached to it. Promises, then, then, simple stuff, right? Everybody's done this before. Um, what you may not know, if you haven't used too much Angular 2, uh, is Angular 2 uses observables for HTTP. And just as a note, uh, that kind of capital HTTP is our kind of preferred term for the new HTTP. We were going to call it HTTP2, but that was going to be confusing, so we didn't do that. Uh, so if you kind of see capital HTTP, that means we're talking about uh, Angular 2s. So observables. Who here knows what an observable is? Yes. Uh, if you've seen any of the talks, this is like what all, this is like all I talk about. This is the first time I probably haven't done a talk that's entirely about observables for a little while. Uh, but I'm going to talk about them because this is what I do, right? Uh, so this is what it looks like in Angular 2. So if you look at that and then look at that, they're kind of pretty much the same if you squint, right? Um, major kind of differences there. You see that we're doing http.get. Instead of calling uh, then, we're calling map. So map is just like map on an array. It takes some data, transforms it. 
Now, and then subscribe is kind of probably a new term to you uh, if you've not used observables before. Uh, subscribe kind of kicks off this whole process and, and we'll step through kind of what I mean by this. But this is just like the, the kind of 10,000 bit view of what uh, HTTP2 looks like or Angular 2's HTTP looks like. So observables, quick review if you haven't seen them. Uh, they're kind of like promises, they do asynchronous stuff. Uh, they're kind of like arrays, they can do many values uh, and they've got stuff like map and filter. Uh, they're lazy, which is quite important when we get talking about HTTP. They're reusable, which is very important when we're talking about HTTP. Uh, they're disposable and they're composable, and I didn't even realize those rhymed, but I get to say them out loud, and they're, they're disposable, composable. We should do a wrap or something. Uh, so an observable. This is uh, kind of the, how you create a basic observable. Uh, it's a bit like creating a promise. So you create a new observable. Uh, it gets past uh, what I call a sync or a subscriber or an observer. And then you propagate values to the outside world. So you use that sync.next, and that will spit a value out to subscribers. And you can see there on the bottom line, I am subscribing to my observable. And so each time I call next on the upper lines there, then it will call the, the value function on, on the second line there. Uh, observables, because they take many, or they can emit many values, right? They'll do next, 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 next. And at some point, you have to know when are they done. So that completes method from the inside will tell you when they're done. Um, same thing with errors, right? So if you have an error with uh, anything you do with an observable, you need to be able to propagate that to the outside world. So you can call that uh, sync.error message to do that. Uh, one of the neat things about them is that they're disposable, right? And if you, if you think about an observable that's going to give you many values, you need to be able to, at some point, say, stop giving me values, right? Like, stop pushing stuff out to me. And so observables provide uh, an ability to do this. So uh, up at the top here, right, where this is like your kind of hello world of observables. I'm creating an interval. It's going to tick every second. Uh, and then it returns a function here. And I've just realized that I've, I've got a missing bracket, so let's ignore that. But uh, it returns a function that when you call that return function, it will then clear my interval, right? So it's like start the work and stop the work. Um, and from the outside, it looks like this, right? So I've got an interval, and I subscribe to it. I get a value every second. And then at some point later, I can call unsubscribe on that subscription object. And that stops the work from happening. And this, is, this will be kind of quite relevant as we get into this. So promises versus observables. This is like an argument that happens a lot. Um, when the Angular team first started talking about this idea of using observables for HTTP2 or for HTTP, um, I was probably one of the most vocal people like in our in our chat room kind of saying this is like a terrible idea like don't don't do this really don't do this and I said to Jeff and a whole bunch of people like this is a really bad idea um, and then I joined the team and they brainwashed me and now this is like pretty much what I do all the time right I talk about yeah, that's a good idea. yeah good. that's awesome so um, and actually that's that's kind of not true like I sort of discovered observables and then decided to join the team I think is probably the, the real thing right so uh, let's look at like kind of how this works manually, right? So if you've ever used XML HTTP requests kind of manually, it's terrible, right? Like it's an awful, awful thing to have to use. So if you're smart, you're going to wrap it in a promise. And that's effectively what Angular 1's HTTP library does, right? So this is your kind of really basic uh, like wrap XHR with a promise. So we have a function there that uh, it takes a URL and then returns a new promise. And inside of that promise, we're creating a new XHR, we're opening it, we're uh, adding some listeners, and then when that onload method calls, we're going to resolve the data. We've got an error handler in case we have any errors, and then we call xhr.send, right? It looks pretty much the same with observables, right? The kind of the way that it looks and we set it up. Again, there's that idea of like creating a new observable. We're doing some work on the inside. The one thing I really want to point out, and the one thing I want you to notice, and this there will be a test on this later, so this is important, right, is that at the bottom of our XHR function here, we are, we've, again, got this abort method. And so this is something that you can actually cancel an XHR request, right? And we see we don't have this ability with a promise. So this is important. So again, pretty similar, except for this, this second part here, where we're, we have this ability to stop the request. And so again, observables for HTTP, why do we care about this? Why are we using them? Because again, they're lazy, disposable, reusable, composable. Nice. Um, observables, so they're lazy, right? This is the first thing, is if you start a promise and an observable at the same time here, so I'm doing this, like these are the two functions we just created, get request promise and get request observable. Uh, if we call our request observable, we're getting an observable back, so this observable here is uh, an observable and this is a promise. The important thing to notice here is that the promise is already, already running, excuse me, the work has started, the, the XHR is running, everything's kind of happening. The observable is not doing anything. It's inert. It's lazy. It's cold, right? So the act of creating an observable, unlike the act of creating a promise, does no work. Nothing happens, okay? 
this is important. Will be a test. Uh, so again, with a promise, at some point later, you can call dot then. You'll get the data out of that promise. And so if it's already completed, if the promise is already resolved, then you'll get the data that already exists. Um, or you know, if it's, it hasn't finished yet, at some point later, you'll get called back with that, that data. An observable, again, we've got this subscribe method. The important thing here is that calling subscribe on the observable actually kicks off the work, right? And not until you call subscribe. So this is what we mean when we talk about laziness. Um, promises, and we go back to this idea of disposable, right? So uh, if you do a promise and you, uh, you, know, you make a request promise, there's no way to cancel a promise. A promise is going to complete, it's going to resolve, or it's going to reject, it's going to error, or it's going to work. But those are the only two states, right? It's going to fail or it's going to work, and there's nothing you can do to stop that. So you end up doing really, really gnarly things, right? So if we don't care about the result of a promise, then we have to like keep a Boolean somewhere and say, like, if it's canceled, don't do stuff, right? Like it's it's kind of a weird, grotty way to do it. And that's this is what's nice about promises. They have these two states, right? But they don't always work for what we need. Um, so observables, and it gets like sorry, it gets worse, right? So if you want to do two things, you got to keep track of two canceled things, and it gets really just really really bad. So an observable by contrast, right? So we've got this observable request. At some point, we subscribe to it. What's interesting about an observable is it's going to return to you a subscription, right? So subscribe returns to you a subscription, which makes sense. Uh, and this foo subscription object here allows us at some point later, like if we don't care about the response or we've navigated away from the page or whatever, we can call unsubscribe on it. And calling unsubscribe will abort the underlying XHR. And this is important, right? Because if we're not caring about the response, why do we want to waste the bandwidth? Can't do that with a promise. So uh, because this is like what I do, again, if you've ever seen me uh, do any talks before, like I do type aheads, I love type aheads, I always do type aheads. Uh, I'm not gonna live code one today because it'll probably explode if I try to do that. So I've already built one, uh, but we'll show it to you and kind of see if this works. I'm really not making funny Hans because this is really hard, but it's really hard, right? Like I hope this works or I'm gonna really have to eat my words. Hey, cool. Uh, so, whoops. Let's see if we can do a quick YouTube search. Search for like cats standing up. It works. Cool. Let's talk about it. Uh, so what I've got here is an Angular 2 component. It's already built, thankfully, right? Um, and I've got two kind of bits and pieces here. So I've got an input. And on that input, I've got an ng form control. And this allows me to basically like grab a reference to the actual sort of DOM element or like an abstract representation of the DOM element. Um, and then I've got a, a list here that's actually rendering, the, rendering those results that you saw. Um, and so what is important here is that this search input is an observable, like many things in Angular. And what it allows me to do is listen to the value changes that are coming off of this text box, right? So every time I top, talk, 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 every time I type in the text box, uh, it's going to give me a new value. I'm debouncing that, and then I'm mapping it, uh, and then it allows me to flat map this. So flat map is like map, except that it waits for the request it's gone into it to resolve, and then it will return me the data, right? So what I'm doing here is taking an input, debouncing it, mapping it into a URL, making a request with that URL, and then waiting for that URL, that request to complete, and then I render it into the view. Um, here in the view, actually, you can see I'm using this async pipe. And so this async pipe does the subscription that I was doing here. So again, let's show you here. We're doing the subscribe. This is how you'd kind of do it manually. But in Angular 2, we can use the async pipe here, and this will actually do the subscription for us. And when we destroy this view, it will actually clean up for us, right? So we go back into our actual little type ahead here. Look at the network logs. And as I type in the box here, organize my windows. You can see a request going out to YouTube, right? Can everybody see that? Yes, cool. Now, this is nice, except that like when I type in the box here, I don't care about the previous request, right? So when I type T, or T, if I could even type the word or T, right, test, I've sent out four requests here, and I've waited for four responses, but I really only care about the last one, right? This is kind of how a type ahead works. So uh, Rx gives us this really kind of handy method here called uh, switch map, which is like flat map, and I'll explain what it does here in a second. I'm going to take out the debounce because this really makes the demo less interesting. So uh, I'm going to take out the debounce. Uh, I don't even know what that's searched for at the moment here. And what I want you to see, and hopefully this will work, and it should because we're on Wi-Fi, 
that I'm going to type really quickly into this box. Yes. You can see what's happened is that it's made four requests, but because I've typed another letter in the box before the previous request is finished, it's actually canceled the underlying request. Um, and so this is good, right? Because we're not wasting the extra bandwidth. Again, you can't do this with a promise, and this is more or less automatic with, uh, with an observable, right? So this is nice. Yes. Cool. I appreciate your support. Uh, so. Demo, good, type has worked. So the next thing about observables uh, that's really kind of powerful and is the fact that they're reusable, right? So if you have an observable and you subscribe to it, it's gonna do some work, right? It's gonna make a request, it's gonna do whatever you do. If you subscribe to it again, it's going to do the work again. So if we're doing uh, an observable that's making an HTTP request, each time we subscribe to it, it's going to make a request. And this kind of at first sight seems a little strange, right? But it becomes a very, very useful thing when things start to go wrong. I've actually done this three times, right? So subscribe, subscribe, subscribe here is gonna do three requests. Uh, Rx gives us some really handy stuff. So like if I don't wanna do this, if I only wanna make the one request, then I have this really simple operator cache that will allow it to just make the one request once and then kind of repeatedly reuse that, right? But the point here is that you get the, ba like the base of observable is to do the work again. Um, so, and for me, like reusability becomes the most awesome thing about this, right? Because it lets us do some really powerful stuff. So, um, I probably should have told you guys this before I kind of came off the stage, but I'm actually going to quit uh, the Angular team. I'm going to start a new uh, startup. So, we're going to call it like Time as a Service. Uh, we're going to call it Timely, right? So, you guys get to see the first worldwide demo of Timely today. Yeah. Uh, so, Timely is it's really pretty revolutionary, and what it allows you to do is find your browser for a start. Uh, it allows you to talk to our server, and we will give you the current time, which I think is just incredible, right? Like, it's exactly, right? Funding, come and see me afterwards, because I will, I will be accepting funding for this. So here you go with the first worldwide demo of Timely. Ah, uh, we'll talk about premium in a second, right? <laughs> so this is Timely. But uh, what Timely's doing, and I'll show you the code, and like we're actually going to show you the code, which is it's kind of open source and revolutionary as well. It's, it's new, right? So Timely is actually making a request to the Timely server in Cupertino every second, right? And we're going to return to you the current time. Um, and so how do we do this? This is, this is the secret sauce behind Timely. Uh, let's see, server clock. So I've got a really kind of simple component here. Uh, I've got an observable here, which is providing me interval every second. Again, we're doing this flat map thing where I'm like, I'm getting a stream of things, and then I'm flat mapping it, and I'm making a request with it. And then I'm just mapping it and getting the response from the JSON out, and I am mapping that and getting the current time. So uh, this is pretty simple stuff. And then you can see I'm using the async pipe here, so I'm doing the current time, and I'm subscribing to it. And then I'm using the handy-dandy built-in uh, Angular async, uh, excuse me, date filter here, date pipe, date pipe, yeah, date pipe uh, with medium to actually render the date out, right? So. This is handy, right? This is pretty cool. Um, but we're a startup, so, so stuff isn't always going to work properly, right? So what if we used our flaky time API? So hopefully Webpack will restart here. So this will work, right? But every once in a while, it's going to explode, right? So I'm getting a 500 back here from uh, the timely API. Because we're a startup, and, you know, we still don't have all our stuff together, right? So what happens with this right now is that if one of these requests fails, so this is getting a 500 back from the server, everything kind of stops. Time actually stops, which is not like not a really good thing, right? Web yeah, we're not web scale yet, that's true, right? So here's what we can do, right? Because observables are reusable, this whole kind of observable chain that I've built here, we can make it just magically work again by calling retry. How do you retry here? And this is built in. This is not anything that I wrote beforehand. This is like a built-in Rx operator that you can use downstream from any uh, request. We can hit retry here. And this will hopefully reload here. So this time, if we watch, and the date is updating, you'll see that request fail, but nothing explodes. Because basically, Rx will just say, cool, let's reuse that observable, subscribe to it again, and everything just kind of magically works, right? So that's, that's timely, just working magically. You can see like every once in a while, it's going to fail. But it's fine, it's not a big deal, because we can just reuse that observable. We don't have to like go back up the chain and reconstruct the request and do all that stuff again, right? Like it's really, really nice and simple. Um, so let's see what else we can do here, right? So this is still like this is still timely free. You can sign up for this on the website. It's really, really nice and simple. Um, but what about timely premium? 
right? What about timely premium? So timely premium, uh, we actually have to sign up. We got. I, I'm gonna, I'll give you a 30-day demo if you want. You can come see me after the talk. But timely premium allows you to pull the server at a much, much higher rate, right? So what about this? Pull up my server here, and I'll show you kind of how this is working. I'll show you the back end of timely here. So timely is a node server, of course, right? So that's how you build startups today is use node. Uh, and we're going to use uh, our throttled endpoint here first. And actually, I'm not even going to show you premium because it's just going to blow your minds if I show it too quickly. So jump back to our original one here. So I'm going to use our throttle time API. And same thing's going to happen here. And this time, what I'm doing is actually we're going to, because you're not paying for time yet, we're going to restrict how many requests you can make. We're not going to let you pull it all that often. Uh, I'll pull up my retry here. And let's let's see if we can abuse the timely loop. Hopefully here. Hopefully people in the back end have written their server properly. Oh, there it goes, right? So we're making too many requests against timely and then it fails out. We say, eh, sorry, 429 there, which says, hey, you're calling us too fast, right? We don't want to do that. So what if we don't want to pay for timely? What if we want to make sure that like, if we're hitting an API endpoint too quickly, that we, again, we don't make everything explode. We just want to sort of say, hey, let's wait a couple of seconds and make a request again, right? Cool, we can do that with observables built in, magical, right? So I wanted to say is instead of retry, which I saw, showed you a second ago, we can say, we can type even retry when. And so what retry when gives us is a stream of the errors coming down the pipe. And what I can say is return the errors flat mapped. This is the actual error coming out. Then I can say, why don't we wait? Like, I don't know. Let's wait three seconds before we do it again. And so this is an observable that's just going to wait three seconds and then emit a value. So it means that we can say retry when, and then we've got some signal to tell the observable, hey, start doing your work again, right? So instead of like immediately instantly retry, like retry does, Retry when gives us control of when this happens. So hopefully, let's see this again. So we'll see a bunch of ticks, bunch of ticks, bunch of ticks. It fails. Three, and then it starts again. All right? Is that worth applause? Come on. Amazing. So you ready for timely premium? Like let's let's see how really cool we can go with this. Okay. So timely premium, of course, is kind of behind a paywall. Um, so the way you have paywalls working here is we've got a token. So I'll switch over to premium. And I just want you to note that when I switched away, all that work has stopped, right? So I have all this like magical work happening on timely. Does its ticks things? Oops. And then when I switch away, it'll stop doing the request, which is handy. So timely premium, right? Here we go. Uh, timely Premium requires you to log in. Uh, so we have a simple HTTP GET. We're doing a login. Gives us back a JSON. We're going to get the token out of that response. And then we're going to store our token in a replay subject. Watch my other talks to learn about what a replay subject is. We're not going to talk about that too much today. So a replay subject is like an observable we can store data in from the outside. And then all I'm doing here is basically, again, this kind of same interval idea. And I'm merging together my interval and the, the token so that we can kind of mash these two pieces of data together and then make a request to the premium API with a token. Cool. Uh, because I don't trust my users, I've set it up so that my token only lasts for 15 seconds, right? And again, we've got this idea here of like, if it explodes, let's wait until I go get a new token before doing the work again, OK? So I'm going to hit login after I pull up the console here, side by side. Everybody know about that? That's a cool little OS 10 trick that I learned the other day. Uh, so I'm gonna hit the login button, and what we'll see is because this is timely premium, a bunch of like really ridiculously fast requests going out, right? So here we go, timely premium, bunch of requests. But this token that I'm using, right? So I went and got a token, then I started doing work. This token only lasts for so long. So we're gonna keep hitting this API, and hopefully that token's gonna expire. And what you'll see at some point happening here, yep, there it is. You can see that my token actually expired. I got a 403 forbidden, and then it automatically fired enough of the, another login request, waited for that to complete, and then fired off back to the premium token API and started doing the work again. Right? You'll see that every kind of 15 seconds or so, 
this will explode, you'll see a failure, right? And then we'll do a login request, we've got a new token, we'll just keep doing work. Does that make sense to everybody? Probably not, but it's cool, right? So what else do I have on my slides here? I think I'm probably near the end. What? If I can get back to my slides. Every time I do this, I get lost. Here we go. Timely, timely premium. We talked about timely premium, right? So they're reusable. Again, just to show you kind of what was happening there, right? So I was doing the flat map, the map, the subscribe, and then something explodes so I can use this retry. Uh, we want to do retry, but we may not like want to retry forever, right? Like if your server goes down, you don't want to keep repeatedly hitting it. It's probably bad. So you can give retry a parameter and say like only retry five times. Retry will try as fast as it possibly can. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you want something more interesting, right? Then we can do this retry when. Uh, retry when gives you the error and it says, call me back when you want me to try this again. So we can do other work. We can do logins. We can do logouts. We can do whatever you need to do and then try to do the work again. Um, this also allows you to do more interesting stuff, right? So like if we have a 429 and we want to wait for five seconds before we do that, we can handle it one way. Otherwise, we can throw an error and just make the whole thing blow up, right? So it gives us a lot of flexibility to sort of say, I have this request. And the nice thing is, is that you don't have to worry about in your application code and your application logic. Really, at the point of the API calls, you can just make API calls. And then downstream from that, you can choose what you want to do. If you want to do errors, you want to do retries, you want to have all kinds of different logic that, that does this sort of stuff. It's just observable. It works all together. It plays really nicely. Um, I'm in the middle of rewriting the, uh, I don't know why timely premium there. I'll just step through this again. Cool. So uh, I'm in the middle of rewriting the HTTP library. It's in the Angular 2 core right now. We're moving it out uh, just so we can kind of release a little bit faster, iterate a little bit faster, um, and also kind of add some of these little features. So uh, Angular 2's HTTP is available now. You can play with it. Uh, the public API isn't going to change very much, if at all, but under the hood, we're going to add some new interesting things. Uh, I also want to provide kind of a suite of these little, little plug-in library things, right? So things like doing an automatic retry and automatic login and doing, uh, you know, being able to polling, all these things are really easy to compose. So it's part of what I want to put in the Angular 2 uh, repo. Surprise, Jeff, I hadn't told you about this, but that's what we're doing. Um, so we've got all these like new features we're going to add in, and they're just these kind of plugins you can pull in and use in your own application. And because this is all observable and it all composes very nicely, uh, you don't really have to think about it, right? It's just stuff you can plug and play, and it all kind of just works as a stream. Uh, that's it for me. There's a bunch of demos. Uh, I kind of like blog about HTTP all the time on my Twitter account. So if you look at Twitter, you'll see uh, a bunch of kind of autocomplete demos. Uh, I will put this code up on GitHub. I have a ton of different autocompletes on GitHub. Um, we do have an open issue right now talking about uh, how we're going to handle interceptors and such. Uh, so that's in the Angular 2 slash HTTP library. Uh, I would love if you would make your comments known in there about your use cases, how you use HTTP today questions, concerns, uh, anything you want to see from the library. Cool. That's it. So right now, we'll welcome uh, Marcy Sutton to the stage, um, well-known contributor uh, in, in accessibility to Angular 1 and also Angular 2, um, visiting from Seattle this week. So uh, let's give her a hand. Hi, I'm Marcy Sutton. I am from Seattle, Washington, where I work at DQ Systems as a front-end engineer we are an accessibility company, so it's actually really cool. I get to work on product development specifically about accessibility, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I work on, how it applies to Angular 2. You can find me on Twitter at Marcy Sutton. And um, as Jeff mentioned earlier, I worked on NG Aria. I worked on Angular 1 material library, adding accessibility to a lot of those components. So I'm excited to be here tonight to tell you about the future of accessibility in Angular 2. So the reason this matters, I mean, it's, it's the right thing to do, but there are a lot of people who need accessibility features. It's estimated about 15% of the population worldwide has some kind of disability, and that's a really broad bucket of, of individuals, but it includes all kinds of different disabilities. So some people can't use a mouse. They need a little more help. Uh, with interfaces that don't completely rely on the mouse. Some people can't view a screen, either on a desktop computer or on a mobile device. Some people can't see low contrast text in designs, which is challenging because we get a lot of designs from designers with really subtle text in them. Some people can't hear dialogue or music, and so captions are really important. 
some people can't understand complex language and the marketing copy that we're given sometimes to put into our web applications and websites. So to flip that around, those people need things like keyboard support. Your interfaces should be reachable, operable. You know, you should be able to do everything from the keyboard. And if you're having to bail out and go to the mouse, which I do all the time because interfaces all across the web don't have this built in, but they should. Um, just making sure that things still work with the keyboard. People need screen reader support. So if your vision is starting to go or you are fully blind, there's a lot more people who have what's called low vision, where maybe you can see on the peripheral vision, but it's blurry in the middle, or your eyesight is degenerative. So maybe you could see, and over time, you know, you're, you become legally blind and you can't drive and you start, things start changing over time. Those people start to use screen readers so that they can do all the same tasks, but have everything read aloud to them. So they can use that instead of seeing. Some people in this low vision camp need higher contrast text. You can use things like um, high contrast mode and on Windows and use CSS media queries for that. But really, you should just try and bump up the contrast in general. Push back on your design teams to say, hey, this text doesn't have enough of a ratio between the foreground and the background. If we can bump those values up, a lot more people will be able to see it, including if you're just outside in the sun working on your laptop, or maybe your projector doesn't have a lot of contrast. So people with hearing, um, hearing loss need captions and transcripts. So things like videos, podcasts, um, having actual typed out transcripts of what was said or you know, dialogue, things that give people more of an ability to follow along if they can't hear it. And then lastly, for the people who can't understand complex language, just really push for plain language, you know, simplify. It'll make your interface appeal to a lot more people when they can actually understand intuitively what it was that you were trying to communicate to them. So guess what? You can help. You can help all of these people by putting some accessibility love into your projects. It makes the internet a lot more accessible. And um, I think in the past, sometimes in Angular, uh, people haven't really thought about accessibility. So I'm super happy to be here telling you about it to try and make this better over time. Because there are things that we can do. The best way for me to tell you about this, other than these high level concepts, uh, it's like, what can you actually do about it? Well, you could build it into your workflow with automated testing. And so we've done a lot of that with um, Angular 1 projects. Um, outside of Angular 2, there's a, a lot of automated testing for accessibility. What I wanted to know was, what would that look like in Angular 2? So that's what we're going to look at tonight. Some things that you could test for. So you can automate a bunch of different things. But for accessibility, there's sort of a segment of places that you should direct your attention. If you're building user interface components, that is where accessibility tests should go. So you should think about writing unit tests that cover the behavior that I mentioned, like keyboard support, um, making things work with screen readers. Unit tests are really great for text alternatives. So things like form labels, um, icon buttons. They're really good for having test coverage for keyboard operability. Like, can I tab to this control and can I make it do things? You could write unit tests that assert that your components are workable with the keyboard. You could watch ARIA attributes. So ARIA is a spec for um, accessibility information using HTML attributes that you can put on your components to communicate to assistive technologies. And I'm not going to go into that a whole lot, um, but I have a bunch of talks on accessibility online that you could look those up on YouTube. I have some on my website. Um, and there's a lot of really great information about what ARIA is if you haven't heard of it before. But to keep us focused on automated testing, I will sort of get hand wavy about what ARIA is. But I'll show you what it, what it looks like. So I have an example from Material 2, which Jeremy Elburn, I worked with on Material 1. So I've been sort of lurking, um, providing component um, feedback when they're specking out these components, but mostly in the implementation, I'm just lurking and watching what you're doing. Uh, so the Material 2 checkbox, it, it has accessibility built in. They've been doing a really great job of considering accessibility up front. 
because that's a lot easier to do. When you're trying to band-aid it on later, it can be challenging because you have technical debt and design debt probably. So I have an example of the material design checkbox, the, the material two version um, using voiceover. This is just a graphic. So when I fire up voiceover on my Mac, which if you have a Mac, guess what? You have a screen reader built in. Um, I, you can turn it on with command F5. So I uh, fired up voiceover and I took a screenshot of what the text output looked like because as a developer tool, it's really useful because you can hear what it says or if you're like really just want to look at what's going on, you could even mute the screen reader and just see the output in text. So when I tab onto the material design checkbox, first of all, I can reach it, so that's good. Um, but if I hit the space bar, VoiceOver will update the value to say if it's checked or unchecked and whether it has label attached to it. So if this checkbox didn't have a label, it would just say checked checkbox. And you'd have no idea that if you didn't uncheck this checkbox, you'd be opting into mail spam, for example. So you kind of need a label. Um, and sometimes this is like a really common thing to get wrong. So what I'm showing you is what it should look like in a screen reader. It should have a label, it should be checked. If we're going to write a unit test for that, um, because this is a really great thing to write a unit test for, um, the material to unit test for this component, um, it actually uses ARIA labeled by um, because it is a custom component to bind it to a label so that it will actually get piped to assistive technology. We use the ARIA labeled by attribute. So it's, um, it's really interesting looking at these unit tests because they're sort of the first material or the first Angular 2 unit test for accessibility out there. These are some of them. So I've pulled in this test that it sets the ARIA labeled by attribute to the ID of the label. We have to do some things with um, asynchronous building. So um, as you will find when you start testing components for accessibility is that you need to become friendly with the test component builder. And this stuff is um, in development. I was fortunate enough to talk with Julia today and hear about some of the things that she is working on. So this is a, a little bit rough to work with at the moment. But the basic idea is that you um, create this, you set up the test component builder asynchronously. You tell it what to go look at either. Um, in this case, it's a checkbox controller. And in, in my demos, I have an actual um, app that I'm pushing to the test component builder. And when that promise resolves, you get a hold of a fixture. And that fixture represents the HTML that you're actually going to run a test against. Once you have a hold of that, you can expect that that element has a certain attribute and then it is the value that you want. Um, you could write, if it was a different ARIA, like a, an attribute that you wanted to watch, like ARIA checked, you'd want to update that and make sure that it, the value is actually changing. So um, you could write separate tests for all of these things. For keyboard support, I have a, an animated image this time of what the keyboard support for MD checkbox should look like. Um, there is a known issue on GitHub. I was really happy to see, I think Hans filed it, that there's no keyboard focus state for this. So yeah, one thing that this component needs is when you tab onto it with the keyboard, it should show you some kind of focus indicator. So known issue, um, that's okay. But you can operate the, the checkbox. And it's easier if you have a screen reader running because you can see that you're on the checkbox. But to unit test for keyboard support, um, I was very happy that this example already existed because this is new territory for um, Angular 2 testing, I believe, after talking with Jeremy today. Um, so you have to do a lot more to test the keyboard right now. I'm going to show you this wall of text down here. It's a custom key event. Um, it's something Travis wrote, I believe. Yeah, a guy named Travis wrote this. And basically what it's doing is um, creating some keyboard events that you can simulate actually um, using keys on this component and then test that it the right key was hit, that you passed the right um, key code. Uh, really tricky detail here. Um, to actually get the right key code, he's passing a space character for the space key. That's the first time I've seen that before. Um, so we need more support to actually be able to pass um, like different key codes. So if you were going to write 
a component, you would have those nice bindings like key up dot escape or key up dot inner. We don't have those in test land yet. Keyboard support is something you should be testing for. Yeah, the idea is that you can actually toggle a thing, and this is something that you can automate. So the next piece, we've looked at keyboard support, um, testing for ARIA attributes. The next thing that you should be looking at is actually a little bit more on the ARIA stuff. Um, and I think I already, I think I was ahead of myself when I was talking about ARIA. Um, the hardest part about testing for this stuff is that it's sort of under the covers and you can't quite visualize what a screen reader user, um, like if you don't use a screen reader every day, opening it up is sometimes challenging because you can't simulate what their experience is actually like. So we tend to use tools that really just let us skip that part of the process and look at what is, is being exposed through the DOM and through what's called the accessibility tree. Um, the accessibility tree is a structure similar to the DOM, but it's just accessibility information. And it's really where ARIA comes into play. So to visualize this, um, this isn't automated, this is manual, but in Chrome Canary, there is a new accessibility inspector. Um, there's a similar one in Safari, and I think um, the Edge F12 developer tools now have a similar thing. But in the Chrome Canary uh, build, you can look at any element and look at its accessibility information. So that's a quick way to just manually look at what's going on with an element. Um, the MD checkbox, we can see that it has a name. So that's name in accessibility can also be thought of as a label. It has the ARIA labeled by, that's where it's getting its name from. Um, it has a role of checkbox, it has the checked attribute of true, and so you can get a little more information about how this is going to work. If you're just learning about accessibility, it's really useful. But in unit test land, we can, we can watch for a lot of those things. As I mentioned, like the keyboard support. Um, you can watch some of these ARIA attributes. I mentioned ARIA labeled by. This is a unit test that checks ARIA checked. It toggles something on the checkbox, and then it just asserts that the value changed. So pretty straightforward unit test. So those are all unit tests that are written specifically for your components. So if you had you know, behavior that's in your app, you want to make sure you have test coverage for those things. And so the, the things I mentioned earlier are ways that you can incorporate accessibility into your unit tests. But there are APIs that you can use to make that a little bit easier. So you can save yourself from testing a lot of the accessibility nuance that I had to go join an accessibility organization to really gain a lot of that knowledge. Um, there's some, some really hairy niche use cases for accessibility sometimes that make it challenging. So you can save yourself from having to test all of those by pulling in an API. Things like the label computation. So I showed you this thing in Chrome Canary. You can see how it says name, and then it says ARIA labeled by, and at the bottom it says labeled by another element. That computation, how they, how they actually um, decide what an element's label can be, can be pretty hairy. So if you were trying to write unit tests to cover every single edge case, as we found in Material 1, uh, we didn't have support for every single combination because it was a lot of work. Um, but if you could test for those, then you could at least know whether something is working or not. So an API can help you check for that. This mic keeps going in and out. Um, you could also check for things like if you used an ARIA attribute wrong, like you typed ARIA-role instead of role, because guess what? It's role, not ARIA role. I didn't know that at first. Um, if you just spell it wrong, it'll catch it for you. It's, it's that um, extra set of eyes that you need to catch some of these things that might not be that obvious. Things like color contrast, data table markup, um, viewport or zooming problems. So you have a couple of options for accessibility APIs in general. Um, this is sort of outside of Angular 2 land because I don't think any of them are doing Angular 2 stuff quite yet. Um, there's one called Quail. There's another API called Wave by WebAIM. Uh, there's the one I work on called Axe. And actually my coworker on Axe used to work on Quail. So he is brilliant and knows a lot of stuff. There's Tenon, which is um, something we worked into Protractor's accessibility plugin that supported Tenon. Um, but you have to have an API key, and I think it's paid now. And then lastly, there's the Chrome Accessibility Developer Tools, which you can also use. Um, I think that they're sort of 
moving more towards like the Chrome Canary um, accessibility support has taken that team's focus a lot more. I'm not quite sure what the direction is for their CLI or for the, the browser extension. But I work on one of these APIs. It's called AxeCore. You can find it on GitHub. It's also on NPM. Um, we're actively pushing improvements to make Angular 2 support easier. Um, but some of the, the awesome things about it are that it runs locally. So your code does not grow legs and go out somewhere and make a remote request. If you're working on an airplane with no connectivity or you have you know, code, you can't let your code leave the building. Um, that might be important to you. It's open source, it's free. Um, I like the business model because it, there's also a supported or enterprise option for bigger companies that need more support. Um, it's great for integration tests and also unit tests. There's a Chrome extension and a Firefox extension. If you just wanna get started with testing accessibility, having an extension just so that you can run it and see if your page has any errors, um, you can see what the API does. It'll return all those results to you. But what I want to get closer to is getting that API integrated into Angular 2. So that's what I'm working on right now. If you're going to test with AxeCore, I will warn you, it is a little bit rough right now because I'm, as I said, actively working on pushing improvements. I heard about this thing called Angular CLI, and I was like, wow, that sounds cool. And they're talking about it at the meetup. How meta is that? So I tried working Axe into Angular CLI, and it was interesting. Um, <laughs> happy I got to ask some in-person questions today. So um, yes, we'll see where this goes. It, the goal is to get this to just be seamless. So you can install Axe in your project, run unit or run either unit or integration tests for accessibility and just have it help you um, by bottling up some of that accessibility expertise into an API. So the first step is you would npm install AxeCore. Uh, the version on npm is not quite ready for this, but that's what it would look like. Um, to get Axe pulled into Angular 2, because um, it's only in the test side that you need Axe. You don't need it in the front end. You just need it in the test. So that's um, has also made this a bit challenging, is that I'm coming new to Angular 2, but I'm going straight to tests, which is like a whole other interesting ecosystem. So to make um, Angular 2 aware of um, a third-party library, just the quick and dirty way, um, you can include it in the Karma Conf. Um, in the files, just point it right at the node module and include it. And this was life on the bleeding edge, figuring out how to get this to work. So to test a component with AxeCore, until we have more TypeScript and ES6 support, you can just declare ax as a variable, give it any type, um, and then that test component builder that I mentioned earlier should become your best friend. Um, the test component builder is what will actually give you a DOM snippet to run accessibility checks against. So by using this test component builder, I set it up in a before each function so that then I could use this third party library in my unit test. I found if they were, if I tried putting the ax accessibility check in the, uh, the promise response for the test builder, um, it just kind of ate the response. So by separating it into a before each function, it made it possible for me to actually run this third party API. So in my unit test, I say, I mean, I gave it a name, it should have no violations because I'm running it against the entire app. So you could pass a, a DOM fragment to X, um, but it's really gonna run the entire set of rules against it. So the best way would be to run it on each page. Then you don't have to, like you can isolate X to be, you know, only run this rule, only run this rule, but you'd be better off just run them all at once on your whole page. So you run check. And Ali, by the way, stands for accessibility. It's a numeronym. Because accessibility check would be really long. And tweeting accessibility takes up a lot of characters. So that's what Ali means. So you type axe.ally check, you pass it um, the, the reference, the, the selector or DOM snippet that you want it to run against. You can pass it some options. I'm not passing any. And then you just pass it a callback function so that when it runs its check, then it will run the rest of your test. So I'm expecting that it should have no violations on this results object that it returns. So I expect there to be zero violations. Um, I'm still working on what this output should look like. So you, if you did have violations, you would know what to do with them. 
because right now it's kind of just dumping them to the console and they're not very helpful. So some places I'd like to improve this um, are just making the integration easier, making that results object that gets returned more verbose and more helpful. So to recap, guess what? You need accessibility tests because it can make the web so much better for people who need it and maybe even you in the future. Who knows what could happen? Um, you need to unit test for keyboard support, microphones working, <laughs> usability basics, things like keyboards, screen readers, um, color contrast. You should use the test component builder for DOM testing. And I'm excited to see some, uh, or hopefully see some improvements coming to that for testing things like accessibility. If you use an API, it can give you some extra accessibility muscle so that you're not down in the weeds writing your own accessibility tests or your own fine-tuned checks for every browser and every screen reader because it can get tiring. And then lastly, you can prevent broken stuff from going out the door because that's why I got into testing. I got tired of seeing things going out the door broken. I thought there's got to be a better way. And that was why I found myself doing testing. So that's it. You can find me on Twitter at Marcy Sutton and on GitHub. And that's all for me. Thanks. Uh, question on the first one, the CLI. Um, I've noticed that Ionic has a CLI. And I just wanted to ask how um, you, know, you guys play with other um, CLIs like Ionic and how the two would fit together. And uh, actually, <laughs> sorry, kind of maybe a naive question, but uh, that's the first thing that popped into my mind. And uh, uh, second question, just a very uh, quick aside. You mentioned CDN, that you would integrate with CDN. And uh, just curious if I heard that right, and how would that work if you know your CDN is typically very uh, vendor specific? You know, you're either working with Akamai or AWS or, or whatever. Um, so just checking if I heard that right, and how would that work? Because you have to you know, specify a specific vendor. It's not obviously something that's in your machine. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Right. You want to do this right away? Yeah. Let's do it that way. I'll answer the second question first, and my friend here will answer the first question. Um, so the second question was about CDN. Uh, so we uh, we want to provide default uh, configurations for CDNs, so that when you import Angular 2 locally, you use your, your local version, but when you build a production build, uh, you use like a CDN version of Angular uh, JS. Uh, that will be for almost everything we support. By, by, by default, that will be everything. If you want to install third, third party packages or if you want to use um, another URL for the, C, uh, the, the CDN, like you don't really like our CDN, you want to use yours, um, there's going to be configuration options for that. The configuration schema is actually being like fleshed out right now. But this is definitely one of the uh, the things that we want to support. And um, there's going to be enough power in the index.html template that you can actually insert your own, like, if production, use this URL. So at the end of the day, you can actually make your own index.html and insert your own scripts with your own URLs. If you want to keep everything local, you could. Or if you want to bundle everything together, you can. We don't recommend it, but you can. Want to go? Yeah, I was going to say, in, in terms of Ionic, I think that their CLI, like our CLI, is probably designed to be pretty much batteries included, like kind of end to end. And theirs is really, really incredible. So I think that probably, like, I don't know there's going to be a whole of interop between the two necessarily. Well, um, but just... but I think that in theory, like, we're going to have a plugin architecture. They have a probably a plugin architecture, and we could probably make it work together. But We've I'm actually talked talk to them a, a bit about potentially merging the two, and we haven't gotten beyond that yet. So yeah. future work. Yeah. yeah. Basically, uh, when we develop the CLI and its features, we just don't necessarily think about other CLI. We about interrupt with other CLIs. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question is about the Angular CLI. So there are already quite few C apps which are out there, and we already uh, started out with one of those. So I wanted to understand how far away from those popular C apps are you going with your Angular CLI? Because we would like to port our stuff from one of those popular seed apps that we took to Angular CLA at some point. So, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I, the answer is I don't know. Uh, it really depends on the content 
you seem to have an opinion on this, but we have a style guide. We have an official style guide for Angular 2 that the CLI will uh, stay close to. It depends on your seed app, but I let Igor uh, answer further. Yeah, so, so the biggest difference is that uh, while all the seed apps uh, help you get started, the CLI will help you maintain the application over the lifecycle of the whole application. So as you upgrade through Angular versions, as you generate more code, uh, the CLI is going to support you. This is not, not what seed apps do because they just help you get started. They bootstrap your project. So that's the biggest difference. Yeah, thanks. Yes, how do I migrate? Yeah, exactly. So basically, you just read the style guide that we're going to produce. You make sure that you see that uh, like is compliant with that style guide, and the CLI will just take it and uh, play with it. Make sure it uses the same module loader because that's what I ran into. <laughs> Which one are you using? Out of curiosity. I think the M Geshev. Minkos, the Angular TC for Minko. Okay, we will talk to him because his, his is really good. I mean, it's really good, right? So we should we should certainly talk to him. Yes. Uh, my question about HTTP, the new HTTP, is it Rx uh, based? And yes. if yes, yes. Uh, uh, which version are you using? Uh, 5.0.0. beta 2. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, kind of similar to the previous question behind me, if you have an existing app, will you be able to use the CLI? uh to generate components rather than the whole app um there is a init command that i didn't talk about where it basically creates some of the main files uh, the most important thing is that your directory structure should follow uh the basic ones but there is definitely a list of steps that will be documented how to move your current application to be able to be used by the cli this is this is important for us because we realize that there is people using Angular too, and um, we want them to start using the CLI as well. Okay. Um, will the CLI have support for a linter, like a TypeScript linter, in it? Yes, there is already support for uh, TSLint, and we're adding support for uh, Code Lizer. <laughs> NGLint, basically, yes. And NGLint supports the idioms based on our style guide. The things that we can statically analyze will give you feedback on how well you're doing on that. Yeah. Oh, uh, I have a simple question for Rob. So um, suppose we load a page, uh, we have to make three requests, and the second one based on the result of the first one. So how could I change the request in observable in the HTTP? So the, the, just so I'm clear, the, the second was dependent on the first. So you're doing like get some data and then use that data to make the second request? Yes, yes. So uh, the simplest way to be is to use flat map. So like the trick to everything observable is flat map. Like flat map is just amazing. So uh, flat map is generally the right way to do everything. So you would do like hp.get, the first request, flat map, which would give you the data from the first request, and then you could return the request to the second request. So we subscribe at the end of this? At the end, yeah. And okay. I think probably the way to think about it is that you, you can typically do all of your composition, all the stuff you want to do, and that's kind of one big observable flow. And then you should typically try to have like one subscribe at the end. OK. If you like. That makes yeah. Sense. That's the exactly problem I'm running into now. Thank you. OK, cool. Over here. Uh, so the question is for accessibility. Um, I saw that we're like, just using callback, but like, is there a, a use case that using um, like, uh, observables will make sense? It would definitely make sense. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, so this question is for Hans. Uh, about the CLI. So I noticed you were doing stuff like uh, generating, automatically generating components with routes hooked up and all that. So one thing I was curious about uh, when you mentioned that is, will there be a very nice way for third party libraries to hook into that without having to write a plugin per library or something like that? Um, there's gonna be ways uh, to create add-ons for the CLI itself. Uh, you would have to install the add-on but there is there we're we're investigating into ways also to have like libraries uh, that would that will also be an add-on. So 
So you will npm install my library of choice, and it's both a, a regular node modules and an add-on for it that hooks into the build system. This this will go through like a Angular CLI JSON file. Get a little bit into the details. I got an accessibility question. Um, so to test accessibility, we use a screen reader like JAWS, but now with uh, you know mobile devices, there's so many mobile devices out there. Is there a solution like browser stack or something like that where you can test for accessibility without having to own all these devices? For screen readers specifically, there there isn't, but there should be. Um, it's a startup idea. Yeah, the, well, the hard part is um, there just aren't there aren't really hooks for um, scripting screen readers, getting them to programmatically do things for you. But I'm trying to drop hints, that <laughs> someone will pick pick that up eventually. Yeah, it depends on the screen reader. Like um, MVDA is open source, that one would be a lot easier to figure out. Um, but I think a lot of the screen reader vendors, I don't know, they just aren't quite playing ball with that. But yeah, I don't know of anything right now. So if someone else knows, I would love to I hear it. I think there might be hooks for Android because I used to own the team that built it, and I think we did that. Awesome. I, we should look into that. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah, because the mobile screen readers um, are some of the most challenging to support, I think, um, especially on mobile web. Like, it's just not as mature. I've done um, a series of talks on that, and that was one of my big hopes for doing those talks was to figure out how we could automate some more mobile testing. Because um, you can test the DOM, but you can't really programmatically check either the accessibility tree or the screen reader. So it's kind of just a guessing game. That's why tools like the one I showed in Chrome Canary are so useful, because they're actually showing you what's happening in the accessibility tree. So to be continued, I think. OK, thank you. Over here. So actually, uh, continuing on the accessibility, so Chrome has not always been the best at having screen reading capability, especially on iOS and on the Mac OS. When you're testing, how do you, are you doing any determination on uh, the browser side just purely from that, or is there anything that you can recommend on those differentials? Okay, so I'm trying to follow your question. Um, yeah, can so, you rephrase So that? for example, if I'm on uh, a Mac and I go into Chrome and I wanna select text and have it read it to me on, the Mac, it won't do that from Chrome using the built-in Mac text reader, but it will do it in Firefox or Safari, for example. So when I'm doing that, those differentials, so I didn't know if Chrome Canary is gonna let me do that or if I still have to use the built-in Chrome capability for those kind of things. For yeah, it doesn't work with Chrome. It's actually a, kind of a, one of those bugs that's been there for about five years <laughs> or four years. And I didn't know if you'd ha had anything with that with accessibility things that you've found for trying to find those things. I haven't, yeah. There are um, open bugs for accessibility in Chrome, and so you can totally go, I don't know, plus one on them or <laughs> publicize them a little bit, be like, hey, I really need this. But yeah, support with VoiceOver is better in Safari naturally because it, they're both made by Apple. Um, I, it's actually surprising to hear that Firefox would be better. Um, Firefox is great for accessibility. It's really great on Windows. Um, I think the voiceover support on Mac, it, we generally just say use Safari. Test on JAWS, and i.e. not with Chrome, but if I'm testing Chromebox. Yeah, I think it's all about looking at, uh, so you, you can't really track screen reader usage. There's a lot of privacy there, so things like testing for performance. Um, that's another topic I'm looking at. Um, so there's not really that much you can do there, but you can look at your analytics, see what browsers people are using, and then from there, look at the most common combinations. 